Okay, so um, I want to talk about um, diabetes mellitus, um, type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus, a little bit about the naming, a little bit about what goes on with each. I have um, an animation to show you, um, and then this interactive activity that I would highly recommend you guys actually going through. I'm probably going to play you a little bit from the beginning of it. So first, I want to talk about the two categories of diabetes mellitus. First, let's r remind ourselves that we've learned a type of diabetes already in this set of notes, but that was diabetes insipidus. It didn't have anything directly to do with sugar or insulin levels. Um, the reason it was named diabetes is that um, it causes you to pee a lot, a lot, so do both of these, but that's really all they have in common. So it's a totally different kind and it's not related to um, pancreatic function or insulin or anything. Um, so these two are different. Um, I want to talk about diabetes mellitus. Um, first, let's talk about type 1 diabetes mellitus. Type 1 diabetes mellitus, um, abbreviated often T1DM type 1 diabetes mellitus, or IDDM, which is insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Um, there is a good write-up about it in your textbook. I would recommend that you read it. Um, what this is, is a hyposecretion of insulin. <clears throat> hyposecretion of insulin. And um, generally, with type 1 diabetes mellitus, it's autoimmune, but it can have a genetic predisposition. So, for instance, you don't inherit type 1 diabetes mellitus, but you may inherit the predisposition to autoimmune diseases, and that can manifest as type 1 diabetes. Um, so it's generally got a genetic predisposition with an autoimmune um, trigger. Um, so this one, what happens with type 1 diabetes mellitus is your pancreas is unable to produce adequate levels of insulin to allow your cells to take up insulin um, because, uh, sorry, uh, take up glucose. Because of that, it has massive effects all over the body because you know that insulin is um, a favorite nutrient mole molecule for cellular respiration for lots of tissues, especially nervous tissue, but not only nervous tissue. So whenever you take in sugar, it stays in your extracellular fluid and instead of going into your intracellular fluid and your cells are swimming in sugar, but they're starving. <clears throat> and there are long-term implications for almost every body system. It impacts, of course, your nervous system and ca can cause neuropathy in which your nervous tissue starts to die off. Um, it can cause problems with wound healing. It can cause, because of delivering all that extra sugar to the kidneys, it can cause kidney failure. It can increase your likelihood of heart disease because of all the sugar in your bloodstream. So it's got a whole suite of symptoms associated with it. And interestingly, um, before we were able to produce insulin in the lab, um, it was very often deadly. So here's a historical photo. This child um, has type 1 diabetes. Um, and this child in this picture is three years old and cannot put on any um, mass, any muscle mass, and has a failure to grow. This picture, even though it looks really sad, is after only three months of treatment, after he was diagnosed and treatment became available. So type 1 diabetes mellitus is going to require an entire change uh, about the way that a person thinks about the nutrients that they, the behaviors that they do, and also um, the decisions that they need to make over the course of a day. Um, there was a 2014 study in Stanford. I can't find the link yet. If I find it, I'll put it in here. Um, at Stanford that said uh, that a person with type 1 diabetes makes up to 180 extra decisions every single day. So just that sheer deluge of requirement, mental requirement, can also be exhausting. Okay, so I want to talk about type 2 diabetes, and then I'll show you a short little animation and introduce you to the other one. So type 2 diabetes mellitus um, is not autoimmune. Um, it is a metabolic disorder that generally, and you can have a genetic predisposition to it. For instance, certain ethnic groups with the same diet and exercise patterns are more likely to get type 2 diabetes than others. 
so a genetic predisposition, but you don't inherit it. Um, so what happens with type 2 diabetes mellitus typically is um, eating lots and lots of nutrient-dense or glucose-dense foods, lots of sugary foods, um, over long periods of time is going to cause this progression. And the progression goes like this, really, really high insulin, really high sugar levels. So let's just take the U.S. South. That's where I'm from. Um, it's not at all uncommon in the South for people to, for instance, put Dr. Pepper in a baby bottle. Terrible idea, but not at all uncommon. Um, cheaper than formula, too. And a lot of times this is associated with poverty. A lot of the really, really sugary foods are a little cheaper than actually really nutritious foods. So let's say 10, 15, 20 years of high levels of sugar in the diet. So what's going to happen is high levels of glucose will cause high levels of insulin. And um, then the insulin will be able to bring down the sugar for the first years. But if I drink seven Dr. Peppers a day and my sugar spikes, my insulin spikes, I try to bring it down. But I keep doing this over and over again, and not over the course of a year, but over the course of decades. What will eventually happen is I will have saturated my bloodstream with so much insulin um, because of this repeated intake of sugar and also low levels of exercise because exercise is a really great way to naturally regulate your blood glucose. But in the U.S. South, high levels of sugar and low levels of exercise are not at all uncommon. Um, so what happens is you are sort of constantly bombarding your bloodstream with insulin because of the sugar that you eat. And what will eventually happen, because you have failed to regulate the sugar, which is what you were trying to do, you will go to a plan B, which is if I can't regulate the blood sugar, I will regulate the response to the blood sugar by down-regulating my insulin receptors so that the target cells will not be as responsive to the insulin that's re released. That may sound well and good until, of course, those in-between times in which you're not actually taking in high levels of sugar, like when you're sleeping, for instance. And then your cells do not respond to normal levels of insulin because of the downregulation, which downregulation, just to remind you, means you have reduced the number or sensitivity or both of the insulin receptors. So they don't respond to normal levels of insulin. And so you get these booms of sugar and then eventually a crash of sugar and a boom of sugar and a crash of sugar. And these um, changes in glucose levels can be really hard on some of your tissues. So with each of these types of diabetes mellitus, it can be hard on, again, um, nervous tissues, um, cardiovascular, kidneys um, can cause blindness, problems with wound healing. All of these things can be associated with e e either one of them. More likely to be associated with type 2 diabetes, however, is obesity, because a lot of times that combination of high sugar intake and low exercise also will lead to obesity, which has its own suite of problems associated with it. And this one, importantly, is almost always preventable. And even in the early stages when you're pre-diabetic, you can usually flip it over, flip it back if it's not severe yet and if you will change your diet and exercise patterns. It's not usually what people do, but it's possible. So with this one, what it is, is type 2 diabetes is a hyper secretion of insulin, stick with me, which will eventually cause a hypo responsiveness to insulin. And all of this is due to massive amounts of sugar intake um, combined with usually low levels of exercise. Now, again, there is some genetic variability, which means that two people may exhibit the same diet and exercise patterns and person A doesn't get it and person B does, just predispositions to those kinds of things. So I'm going to show you a short little video that shows you a little bit of this and then I'll introduce you to the interactive activity. As blood glucose levels increase after a meal, non-diabetics release insulin. Insulin signals the cells in muscle and liver to take up glucose from the blood. This causes blood sugar levels to return to normal. In untreated type 1 diabetes, no insulin is released and blood sugar levels remain high. Type 1 diabetes is treated by injection of exogenous insulin.
This insulin has the same effect as normal insulin. In type 2 diabetes, insulin is released in response to a blood glucose increase, but the cells do not receive the signal. One treatment for type 2 diabetics is Avandia, an oral thiazolidinedione that increases cell sensitivity to normal insulin. An effective treatment for obese patients is metformin, an oral medication that blocks liver synthesis of glucose. Okay, so that introduces you a little to what the numbers might look like. And then I want to introduce you to this interactive activity right here. Okay, um, Inside Diabetes. So it's got a video, but that's not all it is. It actually has some interactive components after you get into it. Um, so this is what I'm going to play for you. Um, and then there will be other treatments at the end. Being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So this is Wilfred Brimley, who says diabetes usually. And it's, this was before he passed away that he made this. It's from the University of Utah. who has They have a really good education component at their Genetic Science Learning Center. So I'm going to play this for you. It's only like two minutes long. And then I will introduce you to what I would suggest you do with it afterward. Being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes means that your blood sugar levels are higher than what is healthy. Healthy blood sugar levels fall within a narrow range. If it falls too low, the brain can't get enough fuel to burn for energy. If it gets too high, sugar can harm blood vessels and sensitive tissues like the eyes, nerves, and kidneys. But diabetes involves more than just what's in your bloodstream. It's a communication disorder that involves the pancreas, liver, muscles, fat, kidneys, and other organs and tissues. In a healthy person, they work together to keep blood sugar levels in the healthy range. Between meals, the liver keeps blood sugar levels from dropping too low by releasing stored sugar into the bloodstream. The liver. After a meal, sugar from food enters the bloodstream and blood sugar goes up. The pancreas responds by releasing insulin. Insulin travels to organs and tissues throughout the body, telling them that there is plenty of available blood sugar to use as fuel. Insulin tells the liver to stop releasing sugar and instead to start storing it. Insulin tells muscle and fat cells to bring sugar channels to their surface. Now they can take up sugar from the bloodstream and either burn it for energy or store it to use later. Most people with untreated type 2 diabetes have two problems with insulin. The first is insulin resistance. Cells stop responding to its signal. Fewer sugar channels make it to the cell surface. Without them, sugar can't get into your cells. The second problem is that the weakened pancreas stops releasing as much insulin. The effect of both problems is the same. More sugar stays in your bloodstream instead of supplying your cells with energy. With less insulin, the liver doesn't get the signal to stop making sugar, so it keeps on going, adding to the problem. Blood sugar levels go even higher. This can even happen overnight, so you might wake up with a higher blood sugar level than when you went to sleep. People with diabetes have several tools available to get their blood sugar back to healthy levels. To learn how these tools work inside the body, choose an option from the list above. So I'm not going to do this right now, but um, I would like to recommend that you guys explore these four other ones if you want to but these four are great to explore okay all right so that is um the we'll finish up with the um, pancreas i already talked about somatostatin all i really not want you to know about somatostatin is that um, somatostatin allows the pancreas to be sensitive to when to stop secreting insulin and glucagon. And then all three of these pancreatic hormones are peptides. 
and you can look at the major targets and we already did this part. So we will stop there.